thank you that you accepted our invitation. And uh, the questions which we would like to discuss are actually in the program. But uh, I like surprises. To some extent, uh, actually, my role here is also a surprise since uh, I'm not uh, Ernest Wojciechowicz who, <laughs> who should moderate this panel, uh, but uh, Ernest, my, my, my friend and colleague, main director of the center even uh, went to the trip in, in Kiev, but he, uh, no, he had to return to Warsaw. So uh, my second surprise is that I would like to ask you one uh, important question, namely, after one year of war, after your experience which you gathered as, uh, as a man, um, now I'm saying to Minister Tatrzycki, who has not left Kiev, who was all, uh, uh, in the march all the time here, and to, uh, from the perspective of Jakub Kumo, who left Ukraine, I think, four hours before the war started. And then you were deeply engaged and involved into, into uh, shaping uh, uh, policy and decision-making process. So after one year, after, uh, you definitely gathered many experience. So what is the most uh, important, what message would you like to, to, to pass to, to our audience? Um, Mr. Toczycki. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lukasz. Uh, dear colleagues, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank uh, two colleagues uh, to Center Sergei uh, Rasmchuk and uh, Mr. Lukasz. Uh, um, for this emotional opportunity to relieve, to re-experience together with my colleagues here this year, super hard year, extremely exceptionally hard year, uh, and really we can see the confirmation of that uh, universal truth that friends indeed in need are friends indeed. To remove any kind of unnecessary emotions, I would like to say that I clearly remember the 24th of February and the first month of that warm addressing Alexander and Bartosz. We discussed it uh, during the first days um, of the unprovoked uh, full-scale aggression on the part of the Russian Federation. We talked to Jakub. Uh, and back then, and uh, the first question was, what do you need? Let's start, uh, let me start with the background history. Uh, well, um, the Ukrainian-Polish relations uh, cannot be called uh, unintensive before the 24th of February 2022. This wouldn't be true. I would like to remind you that uh, during my first visit uh, to Brussels, well, we had the first meeting uh, for President Zelensky with President Duda on uh, the premises of the Polish embassy. That was criticized, but that was uh, very remarkable and symbolic. We had um, um, set of discussions about um, 20, according to the statistics we have to our records. Of course, all this cooperation, Poland has been, is, and will always be the biggest economic partner among the EU countries. And uh, after this war, we will reach the first uh, level of um, of um, our trade relations uh, and uh, we have the biggest uh, the biggest uh, border among the Western democracies with uh, Poland exactly but such relations uh, had certain irritation and the, um, the 20 irritators maybe or agents or irritation on the 24th of um, February, we had the first calls uh, with the offer of help from um, my Polish colleagues. Uh, that's my personal experience. And they were the very first uh, on the 24th. And they are always uh, in the first ranks still. Two nations consolidated around this threat, threat to peace, democracy, and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And over this year, we have covered a uh, longer distance in our relations, removing the barriers on our, as we went. Then it uh, was um, um, 
true for the previous 30 years. Uh, Poland is a hub now, humanitarian hub, political hub, and uh, also a um, hub of logistics, provision of assistance to protect and defend the Ukrainian nation um, in uh, um, their rightful territory. Moreover, Poland is one of the first to render a helping hand around Kyiv when we still have the troops threatening uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki, Vice Prime Minister Kaczynski came to Kyiv to express their solidarity and support for President Zelensky. Poland became the first country together with our partners uh, in the triangle I was referring to that was arranged uh, right before the war in the UK, Ukraine, Poland uh, to raise their voice um, with a message of support for our future membership in the EU and all the other alliances like the uh, three C's um, union. We are invited by President Duda and we are the first uh, in our future into to Poland is the first to support us for our integration with NATO. So uh, what uh, we can conclude from this cooperation, uh, the two nations uh, who have uh, quite complicated uh, background history can consolidate at the right point when the majority even of our partners um, would give us uh, 72 hours then a fortnight um, the polls didn't think about uh, the clock ticking but about the help to be provided and that was the fight conducted by Ukraine to strengthen the basic, fundamental, important, essential strategic things like respect for territorial integrity, respect for human life and uh, fundamental principles of the rule of law. This is something that I would like to consider now and uh, then to continue our discussion to, together with Jakub, my, my colleague. My, I uh, delivered recently a huge interview with your recollections about this period. What experience have you gathered? Thank you very much for the invitation, the opportunity to participate in this conference. Together with Mikola, we met um, on the third, on the fifth day of that war in a helicopter, on board of a helicopter. So, um, Excuse my last Ukrainian. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, for the invitation and thank you very much, Lukas, for, for the job you've been doing for years uh, to build bridges between Poles and Ukrainians. I mean, you did it before it was cool. So, so, so thanks to people like you, it is, uh, we, have a, we have a basis for, 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 for building something on, on, on something solid. Uh, the 24th of um, February, actually, I got a phone call from the Ukrainian ambassador. Um, President Zelensky was trying to, uh, to call President Duda. I mean, he was, this was his first, definitely his first foreign, foreign call. Uh, they saw each other a few hours before I witnessed this meeting. Um, but let me... Maybe this, this will work better. Um, so we left Kyiv um, at midnight, 23rd to 24th of, uh, of February, and, uh, and um, actually uh, came to Warsaw at 2 a.m. Uh, but before, before President Duda decided to visit Ukraine with uh, literally hours to go before the war. Um, it was also built on something. Um, thank you very much for mentioning the, the basic fact about Polish attitude towards this war. We have never believed that Ukraine may fall. That's very simple. Uh, 
reading the American intelligence materials, which are now public, when they claimed that Russians were able to conquer Kyiv within 72 hours, or even in one case, I saw three hours. Uh, speaking to Jake Sullivan, I said, listen, it must have been written by somebody who's never been to Kyiv. In peaceful times, I mean, driving through Kyiv in three, three hours is not possible. And you're talking about taking a huge city, which is bigger than Warsaw, and which is really an impressive huge city. Um, and we were alone in believing that Ukrainian resistance will be effective. I remember two meetings, one with my, my own one with Jake Sullivan. He told me openly, I mean, Jakub, we have very different, we have very different informations. And the other one was between President Duda, President Macron and Bundes Chancellor Scholz. Duda advocated the same, actually the same position. In case of war, it would not be an easy victory for the Russians. The two exchanged glances like saying, who are, who, who, whom are we talking to? Look, this man is crazy. So Poland believed in Ukraine, which, which implicated two things. From the very beginning, our strategy was as follows. Support Ukrainian resistance, arm Ukraine. Of course, we don't, do not have arms ourselves to, to, you know, sufficient for the defense of such a, such a huge country. So we are convincing the Americans to open a hub in Poland. The hub in Zheshev is not has not been inflict, inflicted to us. This is our idea. We spoke about it in December. We spoke about it in February in Washington. President Duda on the second day of the war during the NATO summit literally said that Poland is ready, told everybody, not only Americans, Poland is ready to serve as a hub for weapon deliveries to Ukraine. That's why Josep Borrell, two, two days ago, I don't know what was his reasons, but it was very unwise what he did. He announced, thanking, he thanked Poland for being ready to be a hub. It was a, still a classified meeting at that time, where President Duda used this, this, these words. Only after that, Americans came to us saying, which place would you prefer? And that's how Zheshov was born. And believe me, Zheshov is under no threat, no question in terms of existence as a hub. I mean, no government, be it this government or other government of Poland, will ever, if it's necessary, close the hub. Russians have, has sent, have sent us many so-called warnings, red lines, and so on. No, we are not afraid, we are going to continue. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is, uh, as you mentioned, Polish-Ukrainian history is not always, you know, in pink colors. But there is one thing which is certain about Poles, Polish attitude towards Ukrainians. There, it may be positive, it may be negative. Now it's very positive. But there were times where, you know, communist propaganda were actually portraying Ukrainians in a very bad manner. It was, of course, Russian mis dis misinformation and also part of Russian dividend impera policy. But there, there had never been any significant section of Polish society who would believe that Ukrainians are linked to Russia or Ukrainians are Russian. This country never believed in such a, such a thing because we know you much better which is not the case with all Western partners. Some, some may be, may, unfortunately, there is certain, certain widespread thinking that, you know, it used to be Russia. Mm, they are somehow close to each other, brothers and so on and so on. You remember how President Zelensky was, I mean, absolutely rightfully mad with, uh, uh, I think, President Macron saying about brotherly, uh, brotherly war. Or, or, or Pope Francis, I don't remember. But anyway, somebody, somebody from the Westerners told, said that. No, we do not believe that Ukrainians or Russians have anything, anything to do with each other. And the second, second thing, well, no one ever denied in Poland that Ukrainians are extremely brave. It, it's just legendary in our culture. So saying that Ukraine will surrender to Russia would, for many Poles would, was just uh, like living in another world. Uh, what we were maybe afraid of 
was whether the whole ruling elite in Ukraine will be as brave as the nation. Or what will be the percentage? Because treason is always there when, 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 when there is war. But the percentage of brave and dedicated people proved very extremely high. Uh, before the presidential visit, presidents do the visit to Kiev, uh, I think that on the 21st of, 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 of um, February, Russia recognized the so-called independence of criminal structures in Donbass. Uh, I got a phone call from, pres from the president saying, you know, we were to, 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 to travel to Senegal. He said, listen, Jakob, we are not going to Senegal. I said, thank you very much for that. We are going to Kiev. He said, yes, he said, yes we are going to Kiev. Uh, we had two days to prepare the, 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 the trip to together with President Nauset, of course, in full, I mean, completely secret, uh, secret manner. We met at the border with the Lithuanian president, Duda decided that I will be the only one to, 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 to go with him because he didn't want to put anybody's life in danger. That was probably the most uh, unusual presidential visit ever I have taken part in and probably will never do it again. Meaning we are going to a country when war, where war is imminent. It will, it will just start. It may start during our visit. We don't know how it will look like, whether it will be a descent Russian, I don't know, attempt to, to seize the communication routes, for example. We may become prisoners of war, I don't know what. Or we may, be, we may get into a trap and, and you know, armed uh, security was with, was with us. We were to, in such a case, I don't know what we would do. Definitely, Polish president becoming prisoner of war was not an option. Uh, many people wanted to. As to, to accompany the president, but he said no. He didn't want to jeopardize anybody's life. Uh, when we came to Kiev, uh, we, we had very sincere talks with President Zelensky, Duda with President Zelensky, and I with Yermak and Andrei Sibiga and Igor Zhovkva. For, before that, I remember, you know, everybody was kind of trying to calm the situation rather than, than inside it. Still negotiations going on, still a chance, still a big opportunity that Russians are rather trying to hit Ukrainian economy than really to wage the war. On the 23rd, I remember the atmosphere that um, it was already over. No one, I mean, no, no one of our, of our interlocutors would say there is still a chance. No, it's over, it's over. It's starting, it's, it's now. Uh, when we came back to when we were coming back to Poland, I got just you know phone calls from our um, intelligence services. Jakub, where are you? How much time are you? What's your assessment? How much? How far are you from the borders? From the border? It started after we after we landed. Uh, Duda promised to President President Duda promised to President Zelensky two things. Uh, I think it was done in Wisla during the meeting in, in January. First, in case of war, of course we are at your side. We are not negotiating. Secondly, we will not support any, any international, international binding agreements without asking your, without your, against your will. That's why when we were forced, for example, forced, literally forced by, by France, I can talk about, now openly, about it now openly, France and Germany to sign a declaration calling Ukraine to fully respect Minsk agreements before we sign anything, I took a picture with my cell phone, I sent it to your Mark saying, can we sign it or not? <laughs> we decided we're not going to do, to do any diplomacy around Ukraine without asking Ukraine. And we are very, very, very this is our policy and this is our, our firm policy. And, and third thing, uh, Duda promised to Zelensky and, and then reiterated his promise to many other leaders that in case of war, the border will be immediately opened. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we insisted during the first days of the war, that Ukrainian side stops controlling women and children so that they, they, they pass freely through Poland. That's how, that's how the refugee uh, influx uh, started. And to end my, this part of my intervention, uh, we deeply be, President Duda deeply believed that Ukraine needs also a, a, an encouragement. That was, that was how his idea of 
um, requesting Ukraine's candi status candidate to the Ukra uh, European Union. That's how it was born. Duda announced it on the third day of the war. On the second day, he said we are ready to be a hub. On the third day, he publicly said Ukraine should be a candidate, candidate country to, unite, to the European Union. On the fifth day, he had already uh, support by eight other presidents. Uh, that was his big, two, two big victories, the third being, being of course, Leopard talks. When, uh, let me recall that in Lviv, the, first, the, the 11th of uh, January, President Duda, without asking anybody, just said at the press conference that Poland has taken the decision to deliver, to provide Ukraine with Leopard tanks and is now calling to create international coalition. That's how he created a fervent in, 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 in the international politics and literally forced other European countries, the big European countries, to <laughs> To act because otherwise, otherwise I would say no tanks would have would have arrived until now. Uh, it will, of course, influence the Polish-Ukrainian relations. Maybe I'm not a philosopher, you know. Lukash is much better to to talk about about the the deep uh, substance in the Polish-Ukrainian relations. But definitely, uh, we understand that Ukraine is defending us. Ukraine understands that we are defending Ukraine by 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 providing weapons by by forcing others to provide weapons, by um, making it impossible to do any deals above Ukraine's head, because we are, make, we are going to make fuss around it. We are going to make scandal. We have public, public opinion on the, uh, in the West at our side, and no, no, you know, dirt diplomacy is allowed in this world, in this war. We are, we are, we are going to name and shame it, so they, will, they have to take it in mind. Uh, well, the, the, the impact on the Polish-Ukrainian relations can be only positive, but I leave it to Łukasz. Thank you very much. I leave it to Sergei. Thank you. Th thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your impressive insights and for sharing these emotions of the first day of war and the days before the war. It's, uh, it's really a wake-up call for many people in Europe, and uh, I do believe that uh, information like that, uh, memories like that, should be widely spread. But now I would like to move uh, on with, with, with the questions on the agenda. And the p first question we put here was what can the two countries do together for the new security archite architecture from Lisbon to Vladivostok? There was certain irony in this question because obviously the concept for, of Lisbon Vladivostok uh, security architecture is now outdated. Uh, Perhaps it makes sense rather to talk about uh, <coughs> uh, Lisbon, uh, uh, Lisbon uh, High Shan Wei uh, architecture, which is the Chinese name for Vladivostok. Bearing in mind that China now is interested in new security architecture and uh, announced it. But obviously we should uh, invent something new where the countries of Central Europe will also have their voice and their influence. Obviously Ukraine and Poland have uh, the potential for contributing into such uh, security architecture. And uh, my question to you, gentlemen, is what should we do? to be among the key promoters of the new security architecture in the region and wider in Europe. Uh, thank you, Sergei. I believe that it's not what we should do, but what we have already done and what we are doing for that as two countries that have managed this year together. And when I was uh, talking about the first country that lent a helping hand, I also meant, so I also meant that we shouldn't forget after Ukraine, Poland was to be the first country Russia would go further too. 
And uh, this didn't prevent uh, the resilience, the wisdom, the critical perception, uh, both by Poland and Ukraine, of that situation to be together and to fight for our common freedom. At this stage, I would like to note that Ukraine and Poland, and I would also add the UK to that mix, at this stage are for uh, creating the so-called small unions like Lublin Triangle, Poland, Ukraine, UK. I have already talked about uh, the 3C perspective, 3 Marine Week. Uh, so from Lisbon to, to Ukrainian borders, that is the territory where we enjoy wide democratic support, and that's already the start to develop that further border to Vladivostok. You have uh, correctly pointed out about China, and that has its own interests, but I would like to remind you that in the development of security architecture after any war, and that's a war for Ukraine, that's war for Poland and for the whole democratic world, an important role in creating new security architecture will be played by those who are winners. I already believe that we are winners, and I believe that the democratic world that became that stood together with Poland to protect the main principles uh, to protect the UN statute will have the right, will have the first right to develop the future security architecture. So this security has to be built on the principles in the UN statute. Integrity of borders, territorial integrity, and no right for any state if it, and I repeat, became uh, the member of Security Council in the UN illegally. So no right to veto for Russia. After our victory, we have to go on, and we can go on. And I'm coming back to the economic component, which I named in the very beginning, when the country reconstructs its territories together with democratic world, when together with democratic world, Ukraine brings charges against the aggressor. And uh, I thank our Polish colleagues here who are the part of the great special tribunal. When Ukraine and democratic world will point to all the drawbacks of a Security Council member who violated all statutory obligations. So we are basing our plans on the premise that the right to protect the main principles, to protect democracy, to comply with health and principles of territorial integrity is an indivisible right for everyone. And not a single country has a different privilege than being a part of a democratic world and developing the world so that a person is in the center of any society. So we do not forget that there is, there was and there still be an initiative of creating a security zone from Lisbon to Vladivostok. And we have very little left. We just have to convince that other part, which controls the territory up to Vladivostok or these other countries, which control them, to understand that actually UN statutory principles, the indivisibility of borders, have to serve as the basis for any country's functioning, regardless of the goals that they pursue in their lives. Something like that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, McCollum. Uh, Jakub, uh, how can Poland support us on this way? What, uh, how can Poland help so that the principles uh, brought up by McCollum are actually implemented all over the world? Yes, I'm not. I don't. I'm not. I, I have left the presidency one month ago. I can 
speak and I can say what I think, which is dangerous. I can see some smiles here, Director Dembski, who says, oh, I'm saying too much, <laughs> is smiling. Um, but uh, let me share you my personal point of view on the, on the issue. First of all, I do not believe, contrary to many people in the West, that Russia is eternal, or Russia is eternal, eternally Russian, meaning Russia will come back, Russia will never accept a surrender, Russia will be more dangerous after the lost war, because Russia will lose this war. That's what I, I also share the point of view. Not necessary. Look at Russia. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, Russia was fighting with Japan over the control of Manchuria. Do, does any Russian believe today that Manchuria is a Russian sphere of influence? Of course, no. Do they remember it used to be their sphere of influence? No. Uh, Russia has accustomed itself that Manchuria is Chinese and Russia has nothing to say in the Chinese territory. Um, Poland. Poland, also at the beginning of the 20th century, was a Russian provinci uh, provincial uh, city from the perspective of Russian. Do they remember it? Of course they do. But do they believe that Poland is Russian zone of influence? Of course not. Many of them, most of them, understand that it is not realistic. So they actually put up with uh, reality. Uh, Finland. Finland used to be part of Russia. Do Russians believe that Finland is a special uh, zone of influence? No, they don't. So, after several years, decennies, let's say, after having lost this war, we may accustom, make, get Russia accustomed to the fact that neither Ukraine, nor Georgia, nor Kazakhstan, nor uh, Moldova, or Belarus, is theirs. They have an extremely vast territory, enormously, I would say, rich and big land, not to claim the territory of others. There, if the, a generation of Russians is born, which accepts the basic geographical and political reality, Russia will have a chance to, I wouldn't say to become a normal state like every other else, because this is a much longer process, but at least eliminate one, uh, I mean, imminent, ceasing to be imminent danger to their uh, neighbors. I'm not saying danger at all, because Russia will be always dangerous. Second, my second, my second thought. So, so, so basically, uh, I've been telling it to the Western uh, partners many times. Please do not believe that you can sign an agreement with Russia and obtain a peace forever. No, you will not, because Russia will not accept or um, respect any agreement. But what you can do with Russia is to force upon them a reality. As China, as, China, as China has done, as NATO has done, you can do it. Ukraine can do it too. After, the, after, after you finally win, totally win the war, uh, maintaining this situation for several decennies may Russia be much more uh, reluctant in thinking that some countries are more theirs than others. That's first thing. Second thing is that this is a certain idealistic vision, what I shared to you, with you, but there is also a reality. And what if not? And what if defeated Russia still wants revenge, still believes that, first of all, of course, they will never accept that they have been defeated by Ukraine. They will always say that they were, they were defeated by the treason, by the West, by the United States, by, by uh, I don't know, words world finances, whatever. They will have a full, of, a full set of conspiration theories. Of course, Russia is not moving anywhere, and we are not moving anywhere. Ukraine is staying where it is. So Ukraine, of course, will have to be a very powerful and armed state to, uh, to uh, defend the country against possible next invasion. Poland exact, is exactly in the same position. That's why we are now building 300,000 strong army. That's why we are arming the society, arming the country, spending more and more on, on, on defense. Uh, and now I come to, the, to, the, to, the, to this conclusion. President Zelensky and President Duda had a uh, huge, long discussion about it. And as far as I remember, Zelensky one day said, listen, if I have 300,000 army and you have 300,000 army, together we will have 600,000 army. 
Is there any territorial dispute or any political problem between Poland and Ukraine? No. We are exactly the same position. We have the same danger. We have defined that, the, that it comes from the East. We have no border or ethnic or any other kind of conflict which makes impossible the cooperation or makes, make, makes cooperation difficult. That's first thing. Poland and Ukraine, of course, will have to extend their military cooperation, I believe, after the victory. And it will just, I'm not saying what we are going to do now. I'm, I'm just saying what, what is going to happen within decennies. I, can, I can't see any perspective of any major obstruction conflict between the two countries. Second thing, of course, Polish and the Ukrainian economy are going to be more and more linked to each other. From the human perspective, it will also, this country are linked because, you know, still we have, I don't know how many now, it's two million Ukrainians living in Poland. Uh, our economies are linked together, our families are linked together. Basically, uh, the interest in two countries is to, towards the other one is, is constantly increasing. The number of people speaking Polish in Ukraine is increasing, and Ukrainian in Poland, in Poland is increasing too. Do you remember the first effect of coming uh, of this um, influx of migrants? A part of any other effects was lack of uh, textbooks for Ukrainians in the bookshops. They were bought within within a few 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 few, few days and weeks. Uh, I deeply believe that what we are creating now is a certain community. I don't know, I don't want, I don't want to use, you know, big words like union, federal state, people, you know, some other, other, well, th some thinkers may, may, may de debate about it, but there is something special between Poland and Ukraine. And definitely po Ukraine is not just a foreign country for Poland and Poland is not just a foreign country for Ukraine. The two cannot, cannot make it within each other, without each other. Uh, and my last remarks is about Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe as a whole. This war, that's my perspective based on talks with presidents, with uh, their foreign, foreign, foreign advisors and so on and so on, because my speciality is Amazon Eastern Europe. And I, I basically, I focused on that being president to this, to this advisor. Uh, you know, Eastern Europe, we had certain complex of inferiority, I would say, when we entered the European Union. We are the, we are poorer. We need money. They have, they have finances. What we can do, we can do. We can follow, follow them. We would like to be like them. Uh, the invasion of Ukraine uh, and the defense, heroic defense by the Ukrainians, increased the proud of not only not only Ukrainians but also Poles, Estonians, Lithuanians. Latvians, we understand that we uh, we understood that we were on the right side of the history, and those we are looking to, as an example, just failed. Well, w the two countries which are very popular now in this part of Europe are Anglo-Saxons, Anglo-Saxon ones, because they reason the same way, very simple way. You know, Russia is an invader; we need to repeal the invader. But all those who try to keep business as usual with Russia who try to talk to Russia, try to portray our, our, our policy as, you know, warmongering, they have lost face in big part of continent. That's how ambassadors of one of the biggest countries in Europe are so much frustrated. That's why we had two interviews recently uh, when we were warned that, you know, we have five minutes after that, you will come back to us and so on and so on. We will not. Eastern Europe, this war has less, le, le, led to its emancipation. Uh, that's why, for example, Ukraine, you mentioned 3 initiatives, initiative, very, very, very good. Because actually, during the summit of 3 initiatives, President Zelensky phone called President Duda to ask him for support. And of course, we, we said, we will support you, uh, your membership in the 3 initiatives. When we established 3 initiatives, we were denying uh, we were actually being accused of, of uh, undermining the unity of the European Union. So our argument was, there is no country from outside the European Union within, within this initiative. So we had to smuggle Ukraine. 
but the fact that we changed our perspective also is, is, a, is, a, is a part of this, this, the, this process. And of course, it influences the structure, the, the, the architecture of security. Bigger role of, the, of Central Europe as a whole, bigger role of our Anglo-Saxon uh, allies, Britain, the United States. And a bit, uh, I would say, disappointment with, continent, with our continental partners. Thank you. Thank you, Jakub. Uh, thank you, Minister. Now I'll uh, speak Ukraine. I'll explain why. No. Now I'm going to speak Ukrainian, not English. Why did I do that? Uh, during the war, I visited Kiev a lot, and it's no secret that I also gave interviews to Ukrainian journalists. Almost all of them asked me two questions. The first one, how did it happen that Poland, that has a very complex uh, history with us, Ukrainians, helps a lot? And the second question was, can we say that the center of the European Union has moved east, that now this is Central and Eastern Europe? If uh, we talk about the first question, that's what I answer. Yes, we had complex history, but it was mostly positive. Besides, now history also plays a positive role because it creates a certain cultural code, certain associations which are dear to the heart of every Pole, which also influence the politicians. And they additionally encourage them to support Ukraine. It cannot happen that uh, that like uh, a Russian is uh, somewhere in the Russian city, in a Ukrainian city. If we talk about the center of Europe, my question is the following: Ukraine received the status of uh, EU candidate. We are all hoping that these negotiations about uh, providing Ukraine a full membership uh, finish as soon as possible. But we also see that along with that, there are certain countries, in particular Germany, we say, OK, but if we have to take Ukraine in, then we have to think again, how do we make decisions inside the EU? Like, for example, there could be common external policy. And Jakub has already talked about certain issues, which we had at the initial stage of war. So that question should sound the following way. How can Ukraine change cooperation of Central and Eastern Europe in the 3C initiative? And how can future membership of Ukraine in the EU influence the way of functioning in this organization? I thank you, Lukas. Well, the first thing that I wanted to say is that any concerns from Western partners about deeper and deeper cooperation of Ukraine and Poland have to disappear. What is now demonstrated by two nations in this terrible war, that's the protection of the main principles for the existence of the states. Obviously, any unions which are created and where Ukraine would like to enter are created not to counter anyone, but to protect the values of the European Union and any part of the democratic world. So first, we have to look at Ukraine. And I totally agree here with the message that uh, the West is sometimes afraid that another candidate and then member with this handle stretched is going to come. You, and I mean the West, have to look at Ukraine not uh, like at a beggar, but like at someone who jointly in cooperation with Poland, with the, the other democratic world, is ready to be A, a guarantor of Eastern borders, B, is a rather serious market where people are able 
to provide additional to provide added value i'm now talking about it about machine building rocket building missile building i'm even now talking about uh, shipbuilding so these two elements and plus values which we share and which helped us during this year to remove any misunderstandings the countries that are concerned what kind of European Union is going to be with Ukraine have to look not at the negative sides but at the positive sides and not be concerned what Ukraine will take away from the EU or in other dimensions but what will it add but again uh, here we have already demonstrated uh, jointly with the democratic world that we are among those who are able to guarantee security who are able to produce added value and who jointly with democratic world uh, stands for common interests and values so this is the basis because values remain somewhere on paper somewhere behind but we shouldn't forget that jointly as i have already uh, said many times and quoted for your and our freedom so we are fighting together with poland with the democratic world for our and your western freedom so let us think positive uh, so let's hope that will help Ukraine president and the armed forces to win in this war. Thank you. Jakub? Uh, actually, I already talked a lot. I totally agree. That's the only thing that I can say. First of all, Poland will support Ukraine on its uh, road towards the European Union and NATO. No questions from our side what kind of structure of the union is going to happen that i mean this doesn't matter at all without ukraine europe doesn't exist that's it thank you thank you jacob and thank you mccullough for your vision and now we still have half an hour i'm sure that your speeches have inspired many people to think and even more our guest for the questions so now we have this 30 minutes uh, for questions and answers so that's why I address you. So Dmitro Shuka from Renaissance International Fund, please, the floor is yours. Sorry, don't speak Polish. I'll speak Ukrainian then. Two questions. First to our Polish friends. After the 26th of December last year, Ukrainian official stand is that the Russian Federation is in the UN and in the Security Council uh, in an illegitimate way. Do our Polish friends agree to that? If so, what kind of joint actions we can uh, take uh, to promote this opinion in a wider circle of partners and to increase the support of this idea? because this problem has to be solved. That's the first question. And the second question also to our Polish friends. We have been saying that our region, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, is uh, uh, supports us a lot. But there is one notable exception, let's say. That's Hungary. Does Polish government, Polish society, Polish elites, uh, uh, are they now reviewing their attitude towards Hungary as a traditional ally in the European Union? And if so, what can we expect? Thank you. Well, excuse me for failing to answer to the first question. You know, I'm not in an official position in Poland, so I would like to leave the floor to those who can represent Poland, like Mr. Ambassador. And it would be very, it would be very, very unwise from my side to 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 to, to try to. To, to, to answer the question, of course, I know the position of the Ukrainian government. I know also that the Latvian government uh, advocated a very similar uh, position at the very beginning during the consultations, or Latvian or, or one of our partners. We understand it, of course, uh, and I'm sure uh, the official position of Poland uh, 
if anybody can is in a position to, 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 to share it with you, it's not it's not it's not it's not me. It would it could be erroneously taken. My own opinion could be erroneously taken as a position of the country. Um, second thing, uh, it's Hungary. Mm, this is uh, something I can answer because uh, you know, I, I've been active in, in, in shaping our response to the Hungarian government. And I said many times that, of course, we are very much not, uh, not satisfied with what Hungary does with Ukraine. We believe that this, this, this position is uh, uh, based on a very wrong assumption. Uh, if Hungary, if the gov any government, any government, no matter whether it's Hungary or other, other government, believes that uh, not opposing Russian aggression will detach or the interest of Russia from this country, all this, the, the, this government is wrong. If Russia jeopardizes the whole strategy of security in Euro Europe, there will be only victims. There will be no winners. I mean, even if there is something behind the position of the Hungarian government, it's, uh, it's not based on reality. Uh, we deeply believe that there may be a revision of this polit policy and there should be a re revision of this, of this policy. Uh, the position of the Hungarian government, of course, jeopardized the formats of, of cooperation we, we developed for years, like V4. Uh, it complicated our cooperation within many other areas. Uh, but, surprise, surprise, positively, now positive aspect of it, it also encouraged other members, I believe, other members of the V4 community to, to do more. To, do, to be more active. Well, Slovakia, Czech Republic, are really, this is a discover of the season. How Slovakia reacted to the, to the, to the Ukrainian crisis. I mean, being like the same, having like the same position as, as Poland and the Baltic states. Uh, positive side of, and of course, the Hungarian issue for every, anybody who knows the Hungarian Slovak history do, does play a role in it. Thank you. Stanislav Zulichovsky, Diplomatic Academy of Ukraine. And good morning. Thank you for this very exciting discussion. Here is my question. What is your vision of the Ukraine-Polish relations in Lublin Triangle? And what is your vision, generally speaking, of this format uh, for the future? Uh, will this be uh, at still a triangle, or will be um, will there be any other actors um, joining? And with your permission, Yaroslav, I would like to say that uh, we would never limit our international relations to triangle or three parties, to a triangle or any three parties. The idea of this triangle originally was to formulate and to protect the principles that uh, all the three nations respect. And we are joined by them, they are common um, for us. Um, and joining my predecessor and uh, also as a follow-up to but Jakub's uh, answer, we have the principles in our foundation. If you share our principles, you can uh, join this open um, combination and rearrange the triangle in this way. But with the principal task, the principal tasks are being performed already. You see the unity of the three from the very first days of this war. You can see this unity still and it is based on the interests uh, of uh, the three countries three nations uh, for the united undivided um, space for democracy and security in this part of europe or perhaps in all europe uh, that's uh, the way to, for us to proceed taking into account all the elements specifically i would like to answer your question uh, perhaps we are a candidate and we have this long way to go 
uh, in the negotiation process for accession and also to form the negotiation um, groups. But the experience of Poland and Lithuania uh, will come handy, no doubt, uh, for the expert potential and also for the part uh, you should not forget if we are partners. Uh, still, uh, speaking of the economy, we are always competitors because economy is about uh, competition after all. So this uh, competitiveness will be translated into partnership. That's uh, why we have this triangle and that's why we call it that and present it as that. Now answering a question about Russia. And just one um, background um, note to help my friend Bartosz here. Uh, Russia is legitimate not because of the succession and the papers, but because they are um, the aggressor and they violated all the principles of the Security Council and UN Charter. Uh, talking about the future architecture, we have to talk about the architecture where all of the members, and that includes the guarantors of the Ukrainian security, because we should not forget that uh, no matter how we treat this uh, Budapest memorandum, whatever people call it, uh, full flash guarantees or whatever, on the Russian Federation guaranteed back in 1994 that they would not employ weapons and engage Ukraine, not just the nukes, but we have to read through the six uh, points and uh, there's a, that discussion on conventional weapons. And we are in favor of the democratic world using the um, developments uh, generated by the triangle. Uh, Poland, Ukraine, uh, the UK, three C's, the three C's. And this is the principal matter, which is to protect human rights. And first of all, human right to life. No matter who and how plays with the oil prices, just trust me on that one. With war, you cannot uh, take anything with you and go anywhere. The most important thing is life in this world and we are talking about values here thank you Jakub would you like to add anything format of cooperation on the presidential level between the three presidents uh, de facto between the three presidents and, uh, of Poland Lithuania uh, Lit uh, Ukraine and Lithuania and of course it's not a coincidence that it's Poland Lithuania and Ukraine <laughs> and not, let's say, Poland, Hungary, and Zambia. Because, it's because Poland, U Ukraine, and Lithuania have common history. So understanding in basic things, which is security, is uh, does not require any explanations. It's clear to every everybody there um, uh, what is the structure of security, what is Russia, what is the West, and so on and so on. Uh, I believe that um, there is a big, deep personal credits to President Zelensky, Duda, and now Seda for uh, being such close friends, a part of, a part of uh, leaders of th three, f three brotherly countries. Um, uh, they have really alleviated and created the, um, the atmosphere of cooperation within this format. Uh, it's not a coincidence that the three of them uh, met one day before the War because I should have added, of course, that we tra I, I had said that we traveled with President Nelson, but it was so obvious that we, we, we will be doing it with President Nelson. We didn't, didn't even ask why. The same uh, about the first presidential visit to, to uh, Kiev when presidents of Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia came. Uh, we, we didn't ask why this should be the composition. It was so obvious, natural. We just promised to each other that no one is going to do it separately. And we did. And finally, last last time when President Duda was here, he was also with Nauseda. I mean, I, I served President Duda for so like a year and a half. And during practically all, <coughs> the, 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 the big part of this war. And I think I have met Nauseda maybe 20, maybe 30 times. We have the common, common history, that's the answer.
Дякую. Ще коментуючи слова пана Точицького про те, що... Ще Who was most interested um, beyond the triangle in its uh, operations? Romania and Moldova was, were the champions. Now, Andrei Holub, uh, the Ukrainian week, please. Good morning. We have discussed the architecture of security, security architecture, different designs and different expressions, and this discussion is ongoing, but it seems to me that uh, it is boiled down to the potential to employ uh, force to engage weapons. Uh, we are thinking about the architecture of um, Security, but the leading idea or message in the West is to avoid escalation with Russia. So any security project in our space um, from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean and the principal, the principal part is to avoid escalation with Russia. I have a proposal to take one more question from the floor because are we uh, have Got much time till the coffee break, please. Uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, I just want to have a question relating to the issue of uh, the uh, illegality of uh, Russian in the Security Council because uh, there are other countries who have done similar act, uh, action all, all over the world. In 1956, uh, France, UK and Israel invaded Egypt. So does that mean that if any one member of the Security Council do it, an invasion of another country, they are illegitimate and then they should be removed? Similarly, uh, United States invaded Iraq without uh, international uh, United Nations resolutions. So uh, these uh, acts have been recurring all over the world. So uh, why is the case of Ukraine so different from the others? Thank you. Answering your first question about uh, the architecture of security, first of all, we have to realize that uh, to answer this question, we have to understand what Russia will represent and what will Russia claim and ask for after the Ukrainian victory. As of now, it is very difficult, uh, really, to say that uh, it's power that uh, matters, only power that matters. It's our capacity to defend ourselves. Historically, it is so. Ukraine never invaded Russia or any other country for that matter. So, the processes um, and the processes of designing uh, for future security arrangements uh, are ongoing. I said that uh, in the introductory part, um, the democratic world that is now trying to protect the fundamental principles and values of, uh, will uh, identify the future architecture. And we, as uh, Ukrainian Poland, will uh, be among those who uh, will join this democratic world, will be in the composition and in uh, the edifice um, of that architecture. But we have already to create some vision for the future 
democratic uh, Russian elite. I hope that that, that will that appear for the architects in question. I agree with Mr. Jakub. Uh, Jakub, my friend, um, that Russia cannot be changed, and perhaps it will not change. And this is a very complicated process in its own right, because this is a big Eurasian country, and we have to be extremely careful with all the partners interested in security and um, uh, relinquish, uh, abandoning the idea of using force to change the world order and the borders. But that's the mission of the democratic world, to secure and protect such principles. We are not there to impose anything, if you ask me. Your question. Uh, you're absolutely right about the examples, but the only, the only thing why Ukraine is a special issue, because we would like to challenge this issue, and especially speaking about Russia. Russia is aggressor, and this is our case, and this is to us to decide. And we are working together with the democratic world on this issue. If somebody else would like to discuss the future of the Security Council, etc., you are welcome. You can join us. Thank you. Jakub? Of course, uh, I understand the question, Mr. Ambassador, um, and uh, of course I understand your position, and of course I understand that the 1956 attack on Egypt was, was not legal from the perspective of the international law. Absolutely, and Egypt had the right to defend its territory. It's absolutely, absolutely clear to, to, to anybody, uh, and uh, including to the, the, to, uh, the American, ambas uh, admi American administration at that time. Uh, the specificity of this war, I may recall my long conversation with Thomas Bach, the president of International Olympic Committee, when uh, he forwarded the question, put the, asked the question, why? Um, I mean, not why, but he, he mentioned that there is a question why uh, Russia is eliminated from sport and, let's say, uh, countries which take active part in Yemeni uh, civil war are not. I said there is, a, there, is a, there is one difference between, between the invasion of Ukraine and many other wars, despite the, the suffering of the victims is exactly the same, is that this is a case when one member of an organization tried to annihilate another member an exit territory, probably the whole of its territory if it would be possible, meaning eliminate it. It's just like, you know, there is a difference between a fight and a homicide, or a, a homicide and a mur murder, and this was, this was an attempt of murder. So this war is completely different than any other wars in their, in their outcome. I think the only war when a country tried to annihilate another was Kuwait, invasion of Kuwait in, in, uh, in, uh, in, 19, in 1990, uh, which was strongly condemned. Yes, there are wars. Yes, uh, countries uh, break, break the international law. This is not a secret. I mean, we are grown up people. But one of the sources of the stability of the world, the, of, the, of the world, and the stability for future generations is the principle of inviolability of the borders. If we start changing borders, then we are back in the 19th century, and please count how many wars actually were being fought in 19th century. Every 10 years, a war, a bloody war. It was not, you know, uh, uh, just uh, just just a military operation. It was it was full full scale wars. Was 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 something which human beings may experience several times in their lives. So, so this is this is something I, I just just would like to emphasize as a difference, and uh, without getting into the details, because as far as I understand, the arguments for excluding Russia, Russia from the Security Council are different. It's the question of being successor or not of the Soviet Union, and so on. Legal 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 questions are, legal reasons are completely different. Of course, I will not I will not um, deliberate on 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 this on, on, on this issue. And the the, the previous question. Well, we can we can we can create a common security structure with Russia, but before we do, we need to defeat it. 
No, so Russia defeated must rethink their role in the international community. You know, countries whose president jokes publicly that they have no borders is a dangerous country because Egypt has borders, Poland has borders, Ukraine has borders. Every one of us can draw easily, probably maybe without big talent in my case, try to draw the borders of their countries, Ukraine, Poland, Egypt. We can do it. Russians cannot. Sometimes they, they believe that they border to whom they want and they, they lie where they want to, to lie. No, no, no. They have to accept the, 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 the basic fact of being a, a country. And one, one more thing, when Ukraine is liberated, my position, my personal position, but also President Duda's official position, is that sanctions on Russia should not be lifted within the consent of Ukraine and within the withdrawal of Russia from any occupied territories all over the world. Not, not just, not just Ukraine. Not just Ukraine. Withdrawal of Russia. That's, 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 that's the first thing. But territorial integrity of Russia should be guaranteed. Territorial integrity of Russia should be guaranteed. Russia, let the force their own borders on, on them, on themselves. I don't want. I don't. Want, I don't want. To, for example, I don't like these talks about the dissolution of Russia or uh, separatism and so on. No, let them do what they want. Let them govern their own country within their own borders. Force, let's force their own borders upon them. Thank you. And uh, let me uh, perhaps add one thing, Dmitro, answering your, your question about Security Council and Russia's seat in the Security Council. I perfectly understand that this is a, a legal question whether Russia should be recognized as a continuator of the Soviet Union or not. But to be very open and honest, among Polish experts, um, there is certain skepti skepticism over chances that now, 30 years later, it can be made uh, reverse. Namely, uh, legal question, it's, uh, it's, it's question of international law, and international law uh, consists not only of treaties, but of customary international law, so state practice. And uh, the, the challenge for Ukraine is to now to prove that uh, uh, all other countries did not agree within the last 30 years that Russia is not a permanent member of uh, UN Security Council. So what I would absolutely personally, uh, on my own capacity, advise is rather to think how to implement the basic rule of Latin civilization. Nemo judex in causa sua. Nemo judex in causa sua, it means no can be judged in uh, in his or her own case. It means if uh, there is an international dis dispute, international conflict involving uh, Russian Federation, then Russia should abstain from any voting in the UN Security Council. And this should be, this, let's say, this good practice. And uh, I don't know, uh, we have actually a, a time for one very short question. And would, uh, is anybody who would like to ask? And if not, then I think uh, sorry, you minister ministers could um, yeah absolutely. Deliver uh, I, I guess that then now we have five minutes for for, for our uh, brilliant panelists to wrap up and to say like just very final comments o o on the situation on the topic of our session. Uh, Mikola, please um, uh, to summarize the discussion, to wrap it up, what's the principal message of this um, uh, session? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, after this year when the provoked, this unprovoked war, we have seen clearly that Poland is not just our biggest neighbor, not just a country that has with Ukraine uh, some common history, but also a country capable of critical thinking, taking correct decisions, and most importantly, the thing is that our two nations in this situation, in such circumstances, both united to protect the fundamental principles. Secondly, we have no right in the future to be hostages of certain historical processes. We have to find some solutions. 
rather, because this unity, Polish-Ukrainian unity, will serve as an example for all the democratic uh, world and be and the guarantor. Jakub was right there, fully support him and that, that our neighbor, big neighbor of Russian Federation, does not repeat what they always promise to repeat. And ideally, and be the guarantor of uh, territorial integrity of the Russian Federation, uh, taken ex externally. And I would like to thank the Polish government, the president of Poland, the Polish people for them being there for us at such uh, decisive moment. They were not uh, setting the clock uh, for our demise. Uh, they were creating uh, hubs and coalitions, and they are still leaders in this process. And they are protecting the Ukrainian borders and the uh, fundamental principles of the UN Charter. Thank you. Um, yeah, could be a final remarks. Yeah, really grateful to Ukraine for offering such a huge resistance to Russians and defending Europe and Poland. Uh, we are fully aware that, uh, as Prime Minister Morawiecki said once, when the question of providing Ukraine with tanks was on the table, he said, I prefer these tanks to fight for Ukraine than to fight for Poland after several years. So that was very simple, very simple, and uh, I think the simple comments are the best ones. If there was a map of uh, Central Europe, I mean, I would explain the things in two words. Look at the map and see how the Central Europe looks. As I said, there is a co consciousness, there is, a, um, there is um, uh, an identity of Eastern Europe, pride, pri Eastern European pride being shaped, being shaped during this war. Uh, as much as there is a certain community between, let's say, Arab-speaking countries or between Latin American countries, we are forging very similar, uh, similar um, identity, like being brothers, more than, than you know, countries who are uh, just neighboring countries. No, we don't have these feelings towards uh, our northern or uh, western uh, neighbors, they are good neighbors. They are. We also share history with Germans and others. But uh, what we do, what we do have with Ukraine, what we do have with Estonia, what we do have with Slovakia, is a common, uh, not only common identity, but common fate, because we understand that you know we cannot change, challenge our geographical position. Now, the future of Central Europe as an entity shaped by three initiatives, B9, Bucharest 9, uh, so on, depends highly on whether Poland and Ukraine can reach a, an agreement, a, an, an eternal, I, I would say a permanent agreement. What I'm talking about, of course, history is something which, but I, I don't think that history divides us. Let's look at deeply at the history of nations all over the world. Nations are divided by their own history. Uh, well, Spanish Civil War, let's say, is it part of Spanish Spanish identity? Uh, it's a very sad moment. We also have such 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 terrible events in, in our history. But if Spaniards can be one nation, despite of that, we can be partners, or we can even be one one region, despite 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 positive and negative negative experiences. Uh, now, what is on the table, and which is very important, is a new treaty about Poland, between Poland and Ukraine, which President Duda announced in his speech to the, to the Verkhovna Rada in May. Uh, I had a honor to be co-drafter of, of our part of the, of the treaty. Basically, it will be, of course, presented to the Ukrainian side and negotiated. But what is very important is that uh, the word tandem, I like the word tandem because what we took as an example was a treaty between Germany and France, Elysee Treaty in 1963. Uh, namely, teach, mutual teaching of the languages, harmonogram of state visits, very, very, very frequent, forcing the two countries to cooperate, even if, for example, a government or a president is less interested than his or her predecessor. So we need to do it. We need to do it. We need to create a tandem, tandem between Poland and Ukraine to understand that sometimes, you know, we need to leave a little bit our national interest in the name of something greater. Together we are 80 million people, 80 million people. If Belarus is free, we are 90. If uh, Lithuania joins, 
the, 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 the countries which used to form the same civilization, you know, Israel, Pospolita, Commonwealth, how you call it, we are 90 million, you know, Russia is 140. I mean, Russia, Russia ceased to be, to be danger, ceased to be danger if we create a, 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 a prosperous, prosperous community and, and understand that our interests lay, are linked together. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very good that we exchange the words of gratitude and uh, Beside uh, for Mr. Tuchitsky, I also would like to express gratitude to our Polish colleagues, uh, Polish friends, Polish brothers and sisters who helped us a lot. And uh, that was that was astonishing experience. And uh, I, I do think that many Ukrainians share this vision, if not all. And uh, I also would like to express the words of gratitude to our speakers today, because I think that it was a great panel. And uh, and thank you very much for your contributions, and of course to my co-host. <laughs> tak, dziękuję. Ja też dziękuję serdecznie i panu ministrowi to wszystko mój. I would like to uh, thank um, Mr. Tuchitski and uh, Mr. Jakub Kumo. Uh, much. Uh, this uh, in the Galician part of Ukraine, there's this uh, there's this uh, um, poem, and uh, uh, we have the same hope, and we have the same glory, and uh, we would like to have uh, both uh, Warsaw and Kiev. So I would like to conclude with this with this verse. So we have 30 minutes for our coffee break now.